Tonight's feature presentation, Dr. Tom Keenan. It's with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Keenan, an award-winning journalist, public speaker, professor in the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary. You're probably familiar with his biography, which was shared in the November issue of the Digital Examiner. But there are a few things you may not know. For instance, his lifelong interest in information security led him to teaching Canada's first course in computer security in 1974. In 1984, a series he created on CBC Ideas entitled Crimes of the Future won the Canadian Science Writers Award. The series predicted problems such as identity theft, which seems so common from now or in these days. Dr. Keenan is a qualified expert witness with the Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta in the fields of computer forensics and the internet. In addition to collaborating with law enforcement, law firms and co corporations, he's also spent time with Canadian Forces Bravo Company in Afghanistan. And I'm sure that's another whole story uh, that we may have to have Dr. Keenan come back for. In addition to his monthly column on men's health published in the Calgary Herald, he is the author of Technocreep, The Surrender of Privacy and Capitalization of Intimacy, which was published in 2014. It's available for purchase wherever you get your ebooks, or it's available to rent through the Calgary Public Library. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brad. Because you had a tie on, I went and got one as well. That well, doesn't mean this is going to be a formal presentation. In fact, you know, I'm, I welcome questions at any time. Um, it's not uh, intended in any way to be formal. However, I'm going to share my screen and show you some stuff. Uh, again, I'm a professor in the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape. It's a very long story. I'm not an architect. I'm not a planner. I've been there so long, I'm probably more like landscape. But to be clear, I do teach in that faculty about smart communities and using technology intelligently. So technology and computer security <laughs> have been extremely good for me. You may remember Saturday Night Live, the baseball player, baseball, been very, very good to me. Well, here's how good it is. I came to Alberta as a tour guide in 1972. I will leave it to you to figure out which of those horrible looking people is me. Uh, we we're all injured. So there was a kind of medical component back then. And I led this bike trip that ended in Calgary, fell in love with the place. University of Calgary was still, was six years old at that time. So they gave me a job. They probably wouldn't give me a job today. However, the job came with a certain penalty. I was A, an American, because I had moved from New York City and B, the new kid on the block. So they stuck me with a problem nobody could solve. It was called the missionary on massacre. And in a nutshell, some person, was going around our campus every night, putting a big printout. You may remember the old printouts. This person would put out a printout of all the account names and passwords. So all the security was compromised. And they said, you're the new guy, you gotta figure this out. Well, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I read everything there was on computer security. Uh, it took about one day back then. I agreed to teach a course, I think, uh, somehow you guys got it as 74. Maybe I did, but I know I taught one in 77 because I still have the darn brochure from it. It was all one day long and it cost $95. So basically computer security has kind of been a good thing for me. But in addition, there's this whole idea of smart communities. And this is all going to tie into what I talk about. I had to go to something called the Wayback Machine to get this because it's from 1999. So if you don't know about the Wayback Machine, it's like a time machine. You can apply to many websites on the internet. You find it at archive.org. And so I pulled up this very crude looking Industry Canada webpage on what is a smart community. And back then we defined it as a community with a vision of the future 
using information and communication technologies in new and innovative ways. And, and that definition is still pretty good today. And I'm still involved. I'm on the jury for the Intelligent Community of the Year. And I'm very happy to tell you this year, the winner, which was announced last week, was Winnipeg, Manitoba. So, you know, they beat out little cities like Moscow and Russia, uh, Townsville, Ontario, but even sweeter, they beat out Mississauga, Ontario and Langley, British Columbia. So the only change I would make on this definition is sometimes, and we now call them intelligent communities, you decide not to use technology. So as an example, after the Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand, they were gonna put sensors in all the roads. And a bunch of us said, wait a minute, don't you realize that could be used to invade people's privacy? It could be used to track movements and so on. So they wound up not doing it. Okay, please note I'm not a medical doctor, so there's no danger I will give medical advice tonight. And if I do disregard it, I'm also not a lawyer, so don't take any legal advice. And the views are my own, not those of the university. So I just want to start with a little story. I have a friend named Bill Daggett, and his father, who's in his late 50s or was in his late 50s, then was a machinist. And this tells a lot about technology. They came to Fred, the father, one day, and they said, you know, you're a pretty good machinist, but this new robot can cut with more precision than you ever could, so you're out of a job. And you probably know robots are being used in, in surgery and all kinds of settings. So this guy figured he was too young to retire, and he took a job at McDonald's. And then lightning actually struck twice because that McDonald's, the very one that he took the job at, was designated to be the experiment for the McDonald's of the future. And the way it would work is you'd come up to the gas pump and the gas pump would say, do you want a car wash? But it would also say, do you want a Big Mac? And if you said yes, it already had your credit card, it charged you for that. And there was this contraption that caused a Big Mac or a hamburger patty to come down on a cooking line. And then it sat at the end and you typed in a five digit code and you got your Big Mac. And it was cooked perfectly, you know, untouched by human hands, no, no teenage nasal secretions in it. It was a pristine Big Mac, but people weren't ready for that idea back then. So the project failed. However, maybe it wasn't such a good idea back then. It's come of age now. And I can show you if I just step out of here for a minute and share a different screen, I can show you that technology has advanced far enough that we actually have robotic hamburger cookers. And I'll show it to you and then maybe you can figure out why it's still a terrible idea. So look at this contraption. It's got a conveyor belt. It's got mustard. It's got uh, uh, ketchup. It's got relish. And one of the things that you might notice about it is how darn slow it is. So somebody's got a fortune making this and I consider it to be really dumb technology. Because the reality is any decent uh, cook at a burger joint, drive in or McDonald's or whatever, would do a heck of a lot better, uh, probably in quality and quantity than that one. So I just wanted to, to make that real point about technology <laughs> that if you wait long enough, things do come along and they do you know, appear eventually but sometimes it's not everything that you wanted it to be. So I want to tell you about an interesting competition I got to judge. I mean, what you're going to hear tonight is maybe about six or seven trends and points that I think are important. But this one was more like an experience. I was invited to judge something called the Falling Walls competition. And essentially what it is, it was created in Germany uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and people have to enter, they have to submit a proposal, and it has to be about breaking down some wall. So maybe it's, you know, breaking down the wall of malaria in Africa, breaking down the wall of food scarcity, you know, in, in North America, things like that. So this particular winner from last year, uh, Anna Montalban Arquez, uh, from a lab in Switzerland, won for her 
kind of innovative cancer therapy. And I thought, you know, given the theme of prostate, it was a particularly appropriate one to mention. And essentially what she's come up with is a novel approach to use bacteria as a standalone therapy for colon cancer. Now I know the colon is not the prostate, but the principles are the same and it's showing striking efficacy as monotherapy. So why do I tell you about this? Because to some extent, one of the problems with technology is uh, complication, okay? And you take one drug and then it gives you dry eye. So you take another drug for dry eye and so on. So I am a huge fan of simplicity in therapy. And the idea that uh, this woman who was the international winner of this came up with this impressed me. And actually the reason we got to have this competition uh, a couple of years ago in Calgary is Dr. Leanne Willits, who was also a cancer researcher and, and I'll make sure Dorothy has these slides. If you need any of these names, you can get them from her. But she won a silver medal at the 2015 Falling Walls Lab competition. And she does indeed work um, in, uh, she's a member of the Alberta Prostate Cancer Research Initiative. So if you know her, great. And if you don't know her, you maybe should, because I can tell you, she's a really bright person and she's a really motivated person. So she single-handedly got them to bring the Falling Walls Lab here. And it was here, it was Edmonton, nowhere else in Canada, Princeton, New Jersey, New York, you know, a bunch of major cities. And I'm gonna tell you who the winner was from our competition. So I judged in 2018, because it's also along the medical theme. So it was Dr. Joseph Wong, and his idea was, I think, brilliant. Okay, what he did is he tackled the problem of getting a sample of your small intestine. And he said, of course, like everybody, well, we could cut you open, that would be one way to get a sample of what's down there, but pretty invasive. You know, you might die from the surgery, you might get infected. So of course, technology oriented people go, yeah, well, we can make this electronic device that you swallow like a little pill and it will uh, beam out radio signals or you'll poop it out and it will collect all the data just like a little spaceship out there. And, you know, maybe it'll be a thousand dollars. And, you know, bad for you if you poop it out and miss it because you just pooped out a thousand dollar medical device. Well, his idea is much better. It does it through a mechanical means because he figured out that the pH as you go through the gut changes. And when you get to the small intestine, you can make a mechanical device that dissolves at just the right time. It costs about $10. So the moral of the story, and I wish him lots of luck with this project, is if you solve a problem that helps an ever increasing number of people, good things will come to you. Even better if it's a $10 solution, not a thousand or $10,000 way to deal with it. I'll mention one other thing. I didn't put a slide in about it, but it's pretty funny. There's a drug called Abilify, and um, it has a, an interesting characteristic. It, it's used for... Um, panic attacks, it's used for paranoia. It's a, it's a psych, psychotropic drug, basically. It's given by psychiatrists. And the most interesting thing that happens with Abilify is that they've now created a formulation of it that has the same idea. As it gets into your gut, it dissolves and it sends a radio signal to a patch that you wear, which then contacts the internet and tell somebody that you've taken your pill. So first of all, I, I wrote a story about this. I thought it was extraordinarily bad choice of drugs. This is the first drug that had that feature because it's a drug for paranoia. And you know it's gonna make you more paranoid if somebody is monitoring, did you take your drug? But I will say a few things in its favor. The majority of the people who uh, were given this liked it because it reminded them to take their pill. And if you think about it, there's a social thing here too. If you are getting a drug that's paid for by Alberta Blue Cross, um, someone somewhere ought to know maybe, are you taking it? Are you flushing it down the toilet? Are you selling it on the street? So I'm not saying there's no place for this, 
I do think it was pretty funny that a drug for paranoia was the first one that they gave this paranoia inducing drug. So again, if you want to look it up, it's called Abilify MySite. That's M-Y-C-I-T-E. <coughs> anyway, simplicity is a good thing. That's my first trend. And I want to bring this up to date by showing you how some researchers at the University of Lethbridge and some of our people as well have come up with a urine test. So you might pee into a cup if you get a concussion on the hockey rink or the soccer field, and they are able to find certain metabolites in there. So this is, I haven't even written a men's health story on this, but I will, because concussion is pretty important. And the ability to detect it almost instantaneously with the urine test is pretty good. So here's more on some of the researchers, and uh, it's Dr. Gerlinde Metz, uh, Chantal Debert, and Tony Montina uh, of various uh, University of Lethbridge, University of Calgary. They even have a patent on this. So bravo to them. They not only thought about a good idea, but they took the trouble to patent it, which gives them control of it. And you know, if they take the money and go to Mexico, that's great. If they take the money and donate it to Prostate Calgary, that's better. Who knows? But basically, I want to show you that there is great innovation going on right under our noses, literally, because you have to pee in a cup here. And it looks at 18 urinary metabolites, which together give a biomarker signature. So I know you have lots of medical researchers speak to you. You've probably heard of biomarkers before, but that is one of the big things happening. Okay, personalized medicine. Now, I was gonna do like a little poll, have you had your genome analyzed? Um, but then I thought, no, nah, that's going to be more technical stuff. But if you did, you probably went to Ancestry.com, 23andMe. And I should tell you when I did it, because I'm a privacy nut, I, of course, gave an assumed name. But you got to really think these things through. Let's say you give them a made up name and, and we did our whole family. So we did my wife, our son and myself. We at that time had three animals, one female, two males. So part of the made up name is the animal's name. And that's where it gets interesting. We sent this all off, but just before I was about to pay for it, I said, hey, if I get my credit card here, I'm giving away my identity. I'm linked to these DNA things. So I went down to Shoppers Drug Mart and I bought a prepaid visa card for the sufficient amount of money to pay for our tests. And the funny thing is, the way this card worked, I had to actually register it. So, of course, I registered it to our dog. That was no problem. And I needed an address. So I looked up a butcher shop in Denver, Colorado, because I figured, you know, dogs like meat. And I filled out all that stuff. And sure enough, it worked. The credit card worked. We got the DNA results. But we forgot which one of us was which of the two males. And of course, my son and I agreed to open our results simultaneously, just in case there was a paternity issue. Not that I suspect his mother, my ex-wife, but just in case things didn't work out the way we thought they would, we figured we should be in the same room. But he looked at me and he said, son of a gun, my mother was Jewish and it says I'm not Jewish at all. And look, you're Jewish. And then we realized we had the cat switched, okay? So we had remembered the wrong animal. So anyway, where has this gone to? I got to tell you, 23andMe and Ancestry only looks at a small percentage of the whole genome, 0.02% typically. And of course, they look for interesting stuff, stuff to do with where you might, your ancestors might have come from and uh, diseases that you might get, and they estimate your risks and so on. Now, I know a guy at Harvard named George Church, and he's brilliant. He started about 30 companies, one of which is Veritas Genetics. And Veritas, for $999, was offering to do your entire genome, to do the whole thing. So not just, you know, 0.02%, but all of it, and send it to you. And it was 999 US dollars. And I was going to do it. And then Veritas, when COVID came along, switched to working on COVID testing. But George didn't want to disappoint the world. So he's created another company. 
It's called nebula genomics. And it used to be to deal with Veritas, you actually have a doctor order, you had to have a US doctor order this. So it was gonna be difficult, but now I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna select the deep option, which is 299 US dollars. That actually gets your entire genome. So you will get this file with every genetic thing, your complete bodily blueprint. Now there's a bit of a downside to that. You probably are the you know, genetic researcher. So interpreting the thing is going to be hard. It makes for a nice hobby. There are websites like opensnp.org that will tell you things. So I know, for example, from looking at the part of the genome I already have from 23andMe, that I'm a fast metabolizer of caffeine. I know certain other things about my, my genome as well. So if you were to get your $299 genome from Nebula, I encourage you to try it if you'd like to see it. You're going to have to do some detective work. It will give you some obvious results. But if you want to know the really subtle stuff, if you want to get connected to the research community, be prepared to make this a hobby because that's what it's become for many people. If you can't wait, of course, I've got a friend who drives this truck around the streets of Manhattan and Brooklyn. It's called the Hoosier Daddy Bus, and he basically does paternity testing and things like that. But he only does the very basic stuff. So let's look at what you could, why you should care about your DNA. There are a number of drugs that behave differently depending on your genetic makeup, which alleles you have. I'm not going to get all technical on you, but typically it affects the pharmacokinetics of a drug. Uh, I don't want to worry you by naming any of the drugs. You can ask your doctor. But basically, some drugs, your dosage really should be adjusted because of your genetic makeup. So that is one you know, very specific thing. And then there's genetic counseling for the next generation. So certainly, in certain situations, people should be told not to have children. Because if they're both carriers for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the odds are very high that a child will have that abnormality. And as I said, you know, humorously, it's something else to worry about. A lot of what shows up in your DNA is actually, we don't call it junk DNA anymore because we it's just DNA, we don't know what it does, but it, we, it may not be all that significant to your day-to-day -day life. So I already track a few things, okay, in my own life. I track my weight, my blood pressure. When COVID came along, I thought, well, I got a thermometer. I might as well measure my temperature every day. The other thing is to do a crossword puzzle every morning just to make sure I didn't have a stroke in the middle of the night. I haven't bothered getting a Fitbit. And again, if we were in an environment where I could pull you folks and ask you if you have a fitness monitor, I would do that now. But, you know, you can just silently say whether you have it or not. And one of the reasons you might not want to get one of these devices is it knows when you're having sex. Everybody loves them, but the reality is if it's three o'clock in the morning and you just burned 150 calories, which is a typical male having sex, and you took zero steps, um, this fitness monitor probably knows what you're doing. And the only question is, who's it going to tell? Because typically they're connected to the internet. So you better hope that you're in bed with the right person. And indeed, there have been cases of infidelity being exposed by people whose spouses look at their fitness monitor and they go, hmm, it was 4.15 a.m. You weren't in bed and your heart rate went up to 158 beats per minute. We don't belong to one of those 24-hour gyms, John. Um, just what were you doing? So the point I'm trying to make here, besides having a little bit of fun, is that there can be unintended consequences. And even something supposedly as innocuous as a fitness monitor can rat you out. <laughs> now, as noted here, there's no way of differentiating sex from other exercises. But 158 beats per minute at 415, probably suspicious. I want to talk a little bit about something I wrote in Technocreep. So the book is called Technocreep. And I had some fun with this on how the world is going to get creepier. So it's not necessarily a medical thing, but 
There's a company called Mondelez International. Uh, you've probably never heard of them, but you've heard of their products. They make Oreo cookies. They make Chips Ahoy cookies. <laughs> and they have a new thing called a smart shell where a camera sensor analyzes your facial structure as you walk by in the supermarket. Weight sensors know if you've picked up a product and they work out your, your gender, which is easy actually, your approximate age <laughs> and your body mass index. So what's that for? Well, <laughs> if your body mass index is morbidly obese, you probably are a good customer for Oreo cookies. And indeed, <laughs> you might get a coupon coming out of the shelf or sent directly to your smartphone. <laughs> Even better, excuse my coughing here. <laughs> Even better, there was a technology at MIT called uh, uh, Spot Sound Spot or something like that, that worked like a laser for sound. So what happened is they could mount it in the ceiling of the supermarket and they did actually in Australia. And only on that spot, that yellow spot, you could hear the voice of your conscience. And what do you think your conscience had to say? Hello, I'm the voice of your conscience. You can hear me, but nobody else can. Do you see those bananas over there? They cost more, but they're fair trade organic bananas. Now you know what you should do. Sales of the bananas went up 152%. A number of people went running from this store because they were schizophrenic and they went out legitimately hearing voices coming from the ceiling or the sky. And there's no law against this. I mean, that's another point worth making. So technology like this is going to be proliferating and it's the answer to the question I know none of you asked, well, can I just like hide in my house and not use the internet? Well, sooner or later, you're going to have to go out to buy bananas and this thing's going to catch up with you. Now, I do think the creepiest place in America is the Disney theme park because they now use wristbands to give you access to the park. And there's actually a deep concept behind this because if you don't like that wristband, you can still pay the same amount for each member of your family. You notice they come in the right size, you know, for little children, the big fat wrists, and uh, they have your name on them. But if you don't want that, for the same amount of money, you can get a paper ticket. But when they give you your paper ticket, they say, sir, you do realize you're giving up all your special privileges. And of course, people say, what does that mean? And they go, well, you know, several times a day, you could Go to the head of the line with your wristband. The paper ticket doesn't work for that. So you can imagine you're standing there with your little uh, uh, daughter or niece. She's eight years old. She has a you know, bit of a potty mouth. She sees another family going to the head of the line at Thunder Mountain. And she goes, Dad, what the F are they doing? And you say, oh, that family doesn't care about their privacy. We well, can imagine what she's going to tell you. Now, two more fun things about Disney theme parks. They're, all Disney theme parks are actually a roof on a building called the Utilidor and all the characters. So when Mickey Mouse needs to go have a smoke break or something, he descends into one of these tunnels. And possibly the weirdest thing at Disney parks is called a smellitzer. It is a device that shoots out smell uh, appropriate to the area. So if you're in uh, uh, the uh, haunted house, it'll smell musty. Uh, if you're in Pirates of the Caribbean, you smell the ocean. And they're all concocted scents. They also use it on Main Street USA to pump out the smell of cookies baking. Those cookies that they sell inside are baked like 40 kilometers away in a factory, but you smell them baking and you go in. The point of all this is that there is something I call, and I have a chapter in my book, sensory creep. We're actually being led around by the nose. And I'll give you the weirdest example I found. Funeral homes always use a special floor wash that smells of cinnamon because in scientific experiments, if they didn't quite get the embalming uh, job on cousin Fred just right, the cinnamon smell covers it. So next time you're at a funeral parlor and not the guest of honor there, uh, take a deep breath and you'll probably smell cinnamon. 
Okay, in uh, creepiest place in China, any public street, they have this thing called the social credit system and you get a score based upon your behavior and little things like smoking in a non-smoking zone, buying too many video games, or certainly terrorist attacks cause your score to go down. A lot of people think we are kind of headed to that. So when you have things like popularity scores on Facebook and Instagram, and how many people retweeted, it's sort of a form of this. And a lot of people say China's just a little bit more honest about it. Trend number five is thought reading. So, you know, that's just a, a stock photo of a guy with a lot of electrodes. But I can tell you that functional MRI machines can monitor your brain activity. They have been used for years by what we call the three letter agencies in the US for terrorist interrogation. And what do I mean by that? You show, you put the stuff on some, some prisoner's head, you show him or her a photo of a terrorist cave and the brain will give away whether or not this person has ever seen it. On a more uh, commercial field, it's used to test out new TV commercials and shows to see what kind of a response they evoke. And I wanna show you how good it is. This is work from a professor in California named Jack Galland, and he hasn't been posting lately. This is what his work would do in 2011. So on the left, you see a video that somebody is watching. And on the right, what Jack was able to reconstruct from brain activity. So no, that's not really a good looking elephant, but it sort of looks like an elephant. It sort of looks like a bird. And when I tell you this is 2011, and he now has a technology called Pico Pulse Imaging, and I don't understand what that is, but I'll find out someday. Um, Jack is probably able to read your mind. Also, Google, you remember they used to have a thing called Google Glass, special eyeglasses. In the context of that, they patented a, 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 basically a technology inside the glass that could charge you based on what you looked at. Now we already know that Twitter has done some experiments on how long you linger over something. So if you look at an image, a product, a person, Twitter was timing it to try to decide how interested you were. Of course, maybe the dog had to be let out. You know, you got up to let the dog, dog go out and open the door. But anyway, Google holds a patent on pay per gaze advertising. Trend number six, biometrics everywhere. So Apple is actually working on features on the iPhone to help de detect depression and cognitive decline. And we're not talking about what you type. So if you type, I'm so sad today, yeah, you're depressed. But they are looking at things having to do with typing rhythm and other things, they won't tell us exactly what, to help detect those, at least depression and cognitive decline. <clears throat> now here's a story, there's a technology called US Visit. My wife being a proud Australian is forced to put down her fingers when she goes into the United States. This is not her actual hand, but one day when she was going through, she had a Band-Aid on the finger. And because it's a biometric identifier, it couldn't read through the Band-Aid. And she said, what should I do? And the woman said, give us another finger. And being Australian, Carrie said, will this one do raising her middle finger? And I swear the US Customs and Border Agent raised her middle finger and said, as long as you give us that same finger when you leave the United States. So Carrie had, she thought a little bit of fun with her, but the next 10 times she entered the US, it misidentified her and made her go into secondary. So the moral of that story is don't mess with the customs people. Trend number seven, genetic tinkering. This is way back from 2013. Medical researchers are using genetic engineering to revolutionize the treatment of cancer. Now, again, I am not a doctor, I am not a cancer researcher. I do know what T cells are. They're the white blood cells that fight viruses. And we talk a lot about different kinds of immunity like T cell immunity. And the idea, and again, Dateline 2013, so almost a decade ago, was engineering the T cells to specifically attack cancer cells. 
Now that was then, this is now, or not now, this is 2016. At the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Washington, a meeting that I was at, researchers revealed CART, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. Previously, another type enabled young Emily Whitehead, whose story is, is on this website as well, to conquer her leukemia. Now a new version is showing amazing effectiveness in patients with other blood cancers. And so again, you'll have access to these slides if you want to find more. It would be great, given that you can bring people in by Zoom, that you could get someone like Dr. Stanley Riddell or someone like that to try to explain this to you. Often it's not the medical doctor who does the best explaining, but maybe a PhD student or something. But I do want to share this with you. And I'm actually going to end here and end with good news. And then we'll have time for discussion. So there was a piece just this week on CTV News about a Canadian patient, again, with, with a blood cancer who is, is a survivor. And again, the link is there. I'm not going to play the video because that requires more fingers than I have. But you can look at that video sometime and, and, and hear Avis Favreau, the CTV News correspondent. I do want to make one point that there's risks. Everything has risks. So a couple turned to a company called Genomic Prediction because they had fertilized in vitro fertilization embryos and they wanted to know which one to implant. And using something called a polygenic sc scoring system, these experts were able to say, this is the embryo that probably has the lowest odds of developing heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Okay, three big diseases there and they claim that they could do that. Now, of course, the downside of this, and we know is that this type of technology has been used for unethical things like, tell us, is this going to be a boy or a girl? Oh, it's going to be a girl. Well, we don't want that one. We want a son. And you probably know that there are certain cultures where sons are so preferred that female uh, embryos are aborted, or in this case, not selected. So as I said, I want to almost close with the success story, but here's how I really close every talk, free to good home. This is a real ad, one in a newspaper before the internet, beautiful six month old male kitten, orange or caramel tabby, playful, friendly, very affectionate, ideal for family with kids, or handsome 32 year old husband, good job, funny, but doesn't like cats, says he goes or the cat goes, call Jennifer at this number, come and see both, and decide which you'd like to take. Why do I show you this? Because I could talk for 16 hours and you might remember a little bit of what I told you, but you're gonna remember this. You're gonna remember the point of it, I hope, which is that we're always making choices. So if you put a Nest thermostat in your house, yay, you're doing good things for the environment, you're saving the environment. But I know how to hack a Nest thermostat and so do a lot of other hackers. So in the middle of the winter, Somebody might take your thermostat ransom and say, hmm, give us $200 if you'd like your heat back. If you buy a, four, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, um, I know how to hack that car from the entertainment system. And I actually have a friend who did it remotely over the internet. So this car, and this was prearranged, was driving along a highway in Las Vegas, and suddenly the brakes, steering, and accelerator had been taken over. So there's always a downside to technology. Let's face it, there's going to have to be, but I'm hoping you get the message that an awful lot of technology is good. So do I have a smart speaker? Yes, I do. Alexa, what time is it? It's 8, 19 p.m. And I know that she listens to everything I say because I'm a computer scientist. I also know that Amazon, the company behind that, has uh, promised me that they're not really eavesdropping on me. And, you know, some people would say, yeah, it's Amazon, big company, you should trust it. I have a one word answer to people who say things like that, Volkswagen. We trusted them and they lied on their emission tests. So I'm not saying trust no one. You should trust your doctor. You should trust your spouse. Sometimes you should trust your government. And hopefully you will trust me to know that snowboarding season is opening up this week. That is not me on the snowboard. That is me on the book. 
and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, that's my email address at the university. And I hope that some of you have some questions because I've allowed time for questions. And if we don't have questions, then what will we do? <laughs> so take it away, somebody. So uh, great, great evening. Uh, wonderful information that you shared. Uh, the question I had is, uh, in the news recently, there's been talk of the U.S. Uh, law enforcement agencies taking affirmative action against these cyber attacks. And uh, we've heard nothing coming out of Canada uh, at this stage. Do you think that they're going to uh, uh, get on side with this? And I know let me say something good about Canada first. Um, there's a company called Clearview AI. It's based in New York. I know them quite well. And what they do is they go and they grab your picture off Facebook. So if you haven't secured your Facebook, your Instagram, whatever, so it's only friends and family, they take that picture. They already have your name because you're supposed to use your name. And that's legal in the US. So law enforcement in the US could, and I guarantee you, uh, Brad, you are in this database, right? So, I mean, everybody is, they have 10 billion photographs. So your photo and name are in there and Clearview AI sells this to law enforcement who can then run photos of, of perpetrators, you know, surveillance photos and do facial recognition. In Canada, we have a privacy commissioner who ruled that this was illegal and the RCMP had to stop and Clearview AI actually left Canada. They don't do business here. So that was the something good about Canada. Something bad about Canada is exactly what you said. Our law enforcement doesn't really have the, the cojones to chase down the way the Americans do. A specific example, and I don't talk a lot about it, the University of Calgary was ransomed in 2016. They paid $20,000. I was in Australia, so I, I was neither a perpetrator nor the victim. I, I had nothing to do with it until I heard about it. But anyway, they caught the guys. They're Iranians. And the FBI caught them. So we passed off the case to the FBI. And they have been convicted. Now, the problem is there's no extradition from Iran to the United States. If they ever set foot into a U.S. airport, and you may say, well, that's not likely I know somebody who did a sting. He wanted a Russian hacker badly. So he made a fake company in Seattle. He was, my friend was FBI. He created a fake company and sent this guy a really good job offer and a business class ticket from Moscow to Seattle. So of course the guy took the bait. He was being offered a great job. Well, he was put in handcuffs when he got off at the Seattle airport. So the reality is the FBI can use a lot of creativity to get these guys. Yes, we should get more assertive, if you will. My, my camera's in need of some bag or something here. Uh, there we go. Um, and the uh, we should get more assertive in pursuing these guys. The one thing you don't want to do, I should warn you, don't hack back. I've had companies say, well, we know who they are. We'll get them, right? And it even happened to me. I got a letter from Wanga, a payday loan company. I owe them $763 for the $500 that I borrowed from them. So they kind of messed with the wrong guy because I had the chief financial officer of Wanga and the vice president of Equifax, the credit agency, on a conference call within an hour. And I said, this has got to stop. And they said, don't worry, we've already canceled this thing. And I said, but you got to tell me how it happened. It was somebody in Barrie, Ontario. And they said, well, you're too damn famous. There's enough information about you out there that this guy was able to look you up. He knew where you went to college and stuff like that. And he impersonated you. And the funny thing was, I said, give me his IP address. I'll ruin his life. And they said, no, you can't have that. We, we know better than to give you his IP address and you'll hack back or something like that. And you can't actually get into trouble if you attack somebody else's computer, even if they started the fight. It's like the schoolyard. You can both get sent to the principal's office, which would be the FBI field office. So don't. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. My name is Frank. And I was interested in the uh, start of your brief talk a little bit about the precision uh, medicine and the, and the use of genomic testing and that. And it was interesting because... Um, I was looking at, I have prostate cancer, of course, and I was looking at having some testing done. 
But the one lab, which is here in Canada, I think it's Navigate Foundation or something. First of all, they charge seven thousand uh, dollars, you know, for that test, which is you know a little bit excessive in my mind, especially when you talk about Nebula and the, and its cost relative to that. But also interestingly, you don't get the results. It goes directly to your doctor and allows them to interpret it and discuss it with you. And I'm, I'm kind of curious as to your thoughts as, as to, you know, whether that seems excessive in terms of overall cost. And secondly, whether as the patient, you have the right to get the information or request the test uh, on your own without having to necessarily be referred by a doctor. Yeah, so I mean, that's exactly the problem George, George Church had at Veritas. The FDA said, wait a minute, people are going to practice medicine without a license on themselves. So what he was required to do when it was $999 is a physician had to order the test, US physician, and you also had to have a half an hour of genetic counseling before they would give you the results. So that's kind of a middle ground. So you don't take something that's a total outlier and you know worry yourself to death about it. I can't comment on whether it's seven thousand dollars. I mean, if I told you, uh, you know, a liter of chipmunk chipmunk milk is seven thousand dollars, you would say, well, that's ridiculous. But do you know how many chipmunks it takes to get a liter of milk, right? Well, same type of thing here. I don't know what they go through to do that test, or are they just greedy? Um, we have traveled to the U.S. now, so you can probably shop around if you if you really want it. In terms of giving it to you, um, I never deal with a doctor who won't give me everything. I mean, we have net care, um, so I can see my you know my uh, blood results and stuff like that. But you know, the reality is, I I always demand them, I, that any doctor that I'm going to deal with gives me gives me the complete file, and they do. And I had a doctor who retired, and he gave me. He didn't give me, he sold me $150 for each family member. All of our medical records scanned onto a DVD. And the funny thing is I took to my next doctor. He said, I don't want that. <laughs> Everything I need to know is on net care. So he did not become my doctor. I picked a different doctor. So, uh, you know, commenting on why they want you to go through that, it may be a regulatory requirement. It certainly was in the U.S. for Veritas. But now they're saying, look, there's a lot of smart people out there. There's these sites like OpenSMP.org. If you want to go out there and, you know, at your own risk, try to interpret your, your genome, that's great. Or if you can find a genetic counselor and they're, they're unfortunately very scarce and they're mainly, you know, busy counseling, you know, uh, parents who want to know if they should have a baby or not, right? But, you know, you, you might want to, uh, if it is a genetic test, you might want to try to find a good genetic counselor. Yeah, I hope, I hope that that's the best I can answer it, you know. So we've had a question uh, in the chat uh, from uh, Gary. Uh, a country in Europe is implanting chips in people to be used in uh, monetary transactions. And I did see this piece on, on the news. Yeah. Uh, should we be worried about this type of activity in the future? Okay. We have well, first of all, I have a chip in my hand right here. Uh, it was really fun. I was at a hacker conference called DEF CON. Uh, I'll tell you a website, and you'll never forget it, dangerousthings.com. So my friend Amal, who runs dangerousthings.com, was there implanting chips in people. And he was doing it over two days. So I called my wife, she to me in Australia. I said, I'm going to get, I'd like to get an implant. And she said, what kind of implant? Press, buttocks. I said, no, no, a, a tiny size of a grain of rice chip in my hand. And she said, go for it. So I did, and I have a lot of fun with it. So for example, our university president, Ed McCauley, he has his own washroom in his suite, but if he's down the hall and he uses the executive washroom, my hand opens that. So I have walked by, you know, he's carrying some books or something here, let me open it for you, Ed. And I hold my hand out to the center. So it's only a party trick for me. I could put my Visa card on it. That would probably be a dumb thing to do. And when I go to hacker conventions, I have to wear a special Faraday glove so somebody doesn't hack my chip. Now, should we be afraid of that? I was asked that question. I had my chip implanted on live television in Las Vegas. And the reporter said, aren't you afraid the government will track you? I said, the minute the government gets interested in this, I'm gonna bite it out, which I probably could. And I said, anyway, I control it. I program it, right? So it would be the same vulnerability as your credit card, right? 
if you left your credit card around, somebody could track you by that. The only problem is it's a little hard to get the chip out. So uh, um, in case you don't know, the very first commercial use of these chips was in Ibiza, which is a beach resort in Spain. And I couldn't figure out why till I looked at some photographs from there and the bikinis are so, so skimpy, there'd be no way to hide a credit card or your room key. So this resort uh, resorted to uh, chips in the hand, right? And that's over a decade ago, because I wrote about it in the techno group. <laughs> What's your view on, because I, I get different answers on this, checking out at uh, um, uh, the grocery store and you get the choice of tapping, swiping or inserting your card. Um, I've been told that tapping is the safest. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, on one, in one sense, tapping was the least safe because there were people going around the London underground with readers that if your card was near enough to the surface of your coat, they could actually, you know, authorize transactions. Um, and, and as you know, they've raised the limit for tapping because of COVID. Um, there's a simple answer. They're all safe because if you get screwed, to put it bluntly, you just complain to your credit card company and they have hundreds, maybe thousands of people in the fraud department and they will give you your money back. I mean, if it's American Express, they give you your money back right away pending investigation. Visa and MasterCard start an investigation. But if something happens with your bank account or your credit card, and I've run this by lots of bankers, as long as you didn't do something dumb, if you took your card and you wrote your pin number and grease pencil on it, well, then it's your fault. But if you're innocent, you're going to be fine. So I, I actually use online banking. I try not to use it from the airport or from a hotel and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I know that there's a company in the back and I am doing their work for them. When I checked out at the store, you know, I am moving my stuff through the automated checkout or I'm doing my own payment or something. So, the, you know, the credit card company, to my knowledge, with one exception, has always honored the chargebacks. The one exception was a guy who bought a $78,000 sports car in Toronto and then tried to claim he didn't buy it. And the car was vanished somewhere. And it turned out that was a fraud. I know, I know the guy who investigated it. It was a fraud between the car dealership and the, uh, uh, the consumer. And he said, well, I'll just say uh, that's fraud. I didn't make that charge. I, that wasn't my PIN number. I didn't put that in. And he went to jail, actually. <laughs> no, I, I thank you for that. And I, I do support what you say about um, particularly um, credit card companies. Um, uh, one of my cards, and I won't say which one, uh, has been compromised twice. And each time the credit card company was very quick to put the money back uh, uh, that had been used um, illegally and they gave me a new card right away. So yeah, I, I thank you for your advice. Yeah, I mean, what you do need to watch is, you know, if your credit card statement gets long, there are frauds where they slip in like a 999 charge and you go, oh, that must be like Netflix or something. And I've heard of people who have paid that for like five months and then finally call the credit card company and they say, well, what is this? And they go, oh, that's a known fraudster but they only give them back one month, right? So yeah. moral of the story is check your statements. Yeah, for sure. Th uh, thank you, Tom. Okay, sure. Well, if there's a lull here, I will tell you what's going on in Newfoundland. And I'm sort of qualified to tell you about that because I actually three years ago appeared before as an expert witness before the Supreme Court of Newfoundland and Labrador. It was a health privacy case. In a nutshell, an accounting clerk was accessing patients' records illegally. And she was, oh, that's my neighbor's daughter. What's she in for? Oh, abortion. That's interesting. She wasn't telling anybody, but she still was fined $5,000 and fired. And where I got involved is the patients hired a lawyer to have a class action against the, the Western health region in Newfoundland. Well, that's nothing compared to what they're going through right now, which is this ransomware attack. And I wrote a piece that will be in the Calgary Herald this week that says they should count themselves lucky because here's the ransomware they could have had. They get a notice, administrator gets a notice, um, 
one of your employees clicked on a bad email link. There's no Saudi prince giving him $5 million. Instead, we are in your network now, and we know all about you. We know you have three Siemens MRI machine models, so-and-so. You have five picker X-ray units. You have 243 BD infusion pumps, all connected to your network. So because we have this knowledge, and because there are flaws, vulnerabilities in every one of those, we're not going to encrypt your patient file. That's like 2016. Instead, we're just going to kill a patient every other day until you give us $20 million. So I call this the ransomware from hell. I've only really presented it to members you know, of the IT community. I decided it has actually happened in some US states now where they've had what we call an attack on the internet of things in the hospital. The colonial pipeline one was an attack on pipeline controllers. You can imagine how much worse it is to attack an x-ray machine. And I have a paper from Israel, seven ways to kill somebody with an x-ray machine, ranging from give them too much radiation to hit them in the head with the machine when you move it electronically. So anyway, that's some ransomware from hell. I'm going to explain it. I did explain it in the piece I wrote for the Calgary Herald. And if you're in another city, it will probably show up in your post media paper there, so like Edmonton Journal, Ottawa Citizen. So uh, that's, and of course, my take on ransomware is don't be stupid. First of all, don't click on those links, but also have a great backup so that if your system is compromised, you tell the ransomware guy who wants $5,000, sorry. Uh, I just reloaded my complete files from backup and I'm going to use the $5,000 to take a trip to Mexico. So, you know, basically uh, uh, tell the ransomware guy to get lost. Okay, well, I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, as I said, I'm not a medical doctor. I think I have already given you medical or legal advice. Um, you do have my email address, uh, kenan.ucalgary.ca. If you do want my opinion on something and it will only be an opinion, feel free to email me. I'm pretty good at answering emails. And uh, we will do this again because technology keeps moving ahead, right? It does. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate uh, you making uh, room for us in your busy schedule. So uh, thank you. And we hope to see you face to face uh, sometime in the near future. Well, thank you. Thank you, David, for thinking of doing this. We were going to do it face to face, but we, yeah. we did it anyway, right? Oh yeah, thank you, Tom. It's uh, it's good to see you again, and uh, yeah, it'd be nice to touch base and have a have a conversation uh, about other things. <laughs> okay, bye, guys.